its complexities and mystical jargon, pro football's most important doctrine is simple and direct. Hit harder than you get hit. Today in Cleveland, a dramatically improved Browns defense showed from the first play of the game that it was primed for an all-out effort in destruction. Dallas's famed defensive platoon had most of the credentials, but Cleveland led the NFL in interceptions, and cornerback Mike Howell quickly came up with the kind of opportunism that has been the hallmark of the team all season. Cleveland's offense has gained most of the recognition, and today this explosive force was bolstered by the return of star flanker Gary Collins, who was injured most of the season. Another aerial target is all pro end Paul Warfield, who was robbed of a TD on this play by Mel Renfro. However, Don Cockroft's 38-yard field goal put Cleveland on the scoreboard first, three to nothing. The next time they had the ball, quarterback Bill Nelson again took advantage of Collins' presence in the lineup. Another look at the reception shows what distinguishes Collins from other flankers, his size and the ability to hang on to the ball despite rough treatment. On the next play, Nelson was double blitzed by linebackers Leroy Jordan and Chuck Howley, who forced a fumble. Howley, one of the fastest linebackers in the league, had only 44 yards of daylight ahead of him. Ironically, it was a similar play that beat Cleveland with Frank Ryan at the helm in the regular season game between these two teams. Another look shows Nelson never saw what hit him as he cocked his arm to throw. Dallas was now out in front, seven to three. If Cleveland's offense sputtered in the first half, the Cowboys was practically non-existent. At times, there seemed to be as many white shirts as blue in the Cowboys' backfield. Cleveland's defensive strategy was to attack the quarterback as Don Meredith was painfully made aware. When he wasn't being pounded to the ground, he was pressured into desperate heaves, far wide of any target. Cleveland's offense wasn't doing much better. Despite the fact his line had afforded him the best pass protection in the league this year, Nelson was scrambling more than he enjoyed. And the bomb to Warfield again was thwarted by the same speedy Renfro. Then a pass deflected by Bob Lilly was grabbed by linebacker Edwards, and Dallas had the ball on the Cleveland 33. A Don Perkins draw on one of the few successful running plays of the day gained good yardage and put the Texans in good scoring position. But the determined Cleveland defense forced Dallas to settle for a 16-yard field goal and a 10-3 lead. Nelson tried to hit Warfield once again with the long pass, but the fleet end, who was having his finest year, was effectively double teamed. So Nelson returned to the medium range passes he has employed so successfully this year. Watch Warfield fake his defender out of an additional nine yards on this play. Nelson then went to huge Milt Moran over the middle for 18 yards. He capped this 85-yard drive with a 46-yard pass to Leroy Kelly, who hauled it in with no one but an official more than 10 yards near him. On the play, the Browns flooded the right side with receivers. 
Kelly, who stole into the secondary, should have been picked up by the weak side linebacker as he waited in isolation for Nelson's high floater to come down. The half ended with the score tied at 10 apiece. Kelly's TD shocker had tied the score for Cleveland, but more importantly, they began the second half with momentum on their side. Cowboy coach Tom Landry had predicted defense would make the difference in this game, and he was correct. But it was Cleveland's alert defense that turned the game around, and it happened on the first play. Linebacker Dale Lindsay was in the right spot at the right time, and this is how heroes are made. The Browns were suddenly a touchdown ahead. The sticky-fingered Browns secondary didn't have long to wait for their next chance for glory, as on the next series. Ben Davis hauled in a deflected pass intended for Renzel. The Cleveland sweep is designed to spring Leroy Kelly and it worked to perfection as the league's leading runner and scorer ran and scored. The ground camera shows the key blocks were by number 73, Monty Clark on the cornerback Downfield by number 54, center Fred Hoagland on the safety. In the space of two minutes, the underdog Browns had zoomed to a 14-point lead. In an effort to generate some spark, Landry inserted Craig Morton at quarterback, and the difference was immediately discernible. Rolling left, he hit Rensel for 14 yards. And then found him again, wide open down the opposite sideline for 48 yards deep in Cleveland territory. But on this day, it mattered little who was quarterbacking. Despite the varied and complex Dallas formations, the Browns' recognition and reaction was nearly automatic and almost always effective, as Captain Jim Houston illustrates. Morton, under terrific pressure in his backfield, barely got this toss off. Houston muffed a certain interception. After a penalty pushed them back, Morton, with 270-pound Jim Kanicki on his back, somehow unloaded a pass to Pettis Norman that put the club in field goal range. And Mike Clark made the long kick good. Rounds 24, Dallas 13. The next time they had the ball, Don Perkins fought for a nice game, just as the quarter ended. Then Morton pitched to Rensel, slanting over the middle, and it appeared as if Dallas was finally moving. Middle linebacker Bob Matheson plugged a hole to stop Bainham for no gain. And the 11-year veteran, Erich Barnes, triumphantly applied the clincher, the Browns' fourth interception. It was the Browns' offense who finally went into high gear when they most needed it. Kelly, with his incredible starting speed, shot through the middle for 18 yards.
Milt Morin, who has become one of the fine tight ends in the game, took a short pitch and went down begrudgingly. On third and one, Nelson disdained the obvious and gambled with a long pass to Warfield off a of play action. It worked for 39 yards and a very big first down. Next, Nelson went to Morin despite tight coverage, and he hung on at the two-yard line. Behind near perfect blocking, Ernie Green skirted right end for the score that put it out of reach. Nelson's choice for the play was appropriate, since the valuable Green's role has been limited this year due to a severe knee injury. Dallas scored a meaningless touchdown in the waning seconds of the game to bring the final score to 31-20. The Cleveland Browns had won the Eastern Division title and in doing so had decisively beaten a team experts had chosen as successor to Green Bay's Packers. They proved that an earlier win over the Baltimore Colts was no accident. That victory came after a faltering start and was the catalyst for a string of eight straight impressive victories, a streak that can be nothing less and a testimonial to their coach, Blanton Collier. He replaced one of the proven quarterbacks in the NFL with one who had never played with a winner. And he overcame a succession of injuries to key performers. He did this, and at the same time upheld the Browns' tradition as the winningest team in pro football. In Baltimore, this teenage beauty queen welcomed the sell-out crowd to the Western Conference Championship. But the players did not welcome each other in quite so cordial a manner. In fact, Colts quarterback Earl Morrow was the recipient of one of the rudest welcomes ever seen. In the first quarter alone, the Vikings' devastating front four dumped Morrow three times to stymie his passing attack. While on the ground, the story was the same. The Viking defense refused to allow any penetration, and it was obvious that they had come to play. But the Vaughn and Colt defense was also hitting with its usual abandon, and in fact, the first quarter was a defensive spectacular, with neither team able to move through or over the muddy field. In a scoreless first quarter, the only offense generated by the Vikings was the scrambling of the Vikings' strong and gutsy quarterback, Joe Cap, who took his lumps in the process. The second quarter looked like a carbon copy of the first. Marshall, Eller, and Page were wreaking havoc on the Colt machine, and their tremendous pressure allowed Viking defensive backs to come up fast to shut off the outside. It seemed that one break for either team might make the difference. And early in the quarter, Cap threw his first interception, which Jerry Logan picked up and carried to the 28. But the Colts lost their break on the very next play when Tom Matty fumbled and the Vikings Earsell McBee recovered. On the last play, it was number 22, Paul Krause, who knocked the ball loose from Matty's grasp as he tried to struggle for a few extra yards. Cap failed to move his club again on the ensuing series as the two teams were virtually even in every category thus far. There had been only one noticeable advantage for the Colts offensive unit until now, and this was the combination of Marl to Richardson. 
Willie was being covered quite loosely by Ersel McBee. And when he had time to throw, Marl had found him wide open. But it took one of the great catches of the year by Richardson to really shake the Vikings for the first time. Two plays later, using two tight ends, Marl hit one of them, Tom Mitchell, an AFL cast off for the first score of the game. Late in the half, it was the Colts seven, the Vikings nothing. The Vikings needed a score before halftime but they were not destined to get it, although Earl Denny's return gave them good field position. Cap, like Marl, was under extreme pressure from the defense, and it helped cause him to throw his second interception, which number 40, Bobby Boyd, returned to the 33. Morrow was not content to run out the clock, and behind protection that was improving steadily, he spiraled a pass to split end Jimmy Orr for his first catch of the game to the Vikings 45. But Morrow then made his first and only mistake of the game, as he underthrew Orr and Ed Shirokman intercepted to stop the Colts' second real threat. With a minute to play, Cap found success with short passes to his versatile fullback, Bill Brown. Success due largely to a prevent defense designed to stop the long bomb. Of course, the best pass defense is a strong pass rush. And Fred Miller got to Cap and gently laid him down for the first time in the game. With seven seconds left, Cap hit Gene Washington down the middle. But time ran out on the Vikings as Washington was tackled. The third quarter would be the key to this game as it was in the Cleveland-Dallas game. The Colts' defense, like the Browns, would make the ultimate difference in the outcome. They began to pressure Cap more and more as the game progressed. Safety Rick Volk almost decapitated Cap on this play to stop a Viking drive. In the first half, Willie Richardson was Marl's main target. Now it was tight end John Mackey, a devastating receiver and runner once he has the ball. Mackey had been beating his man over the middle, so Marl called the same play again on the next series and this time, Mackey went all the way on a thundering 50-yard catch and run, which made it 14 to nothing midway through the quarter. Mackey had rarely been used in the first half, and it was this adjustment by coach Don Shula at halftime that played one of the key roles in the game. Clint Jones' 30-yard return of the kickoff again put the Vikings in good shape to start their next series. But again, a major disaster was to follow. Coming hard from the blind side, Bubba Smith and Ordell Bracey jarred the ball from Cap's arm. A blitzing Mike Curtis caught it on the fly, and the former fullback rumbled 60 yards for the Colts' second touchdown in less than two minutes. Of course, this was the big play, the play which completely shocked and demoralized the toughened Vikings, who, though 21 points behind, were still hanging in there, but now only by their thumbs.
Down by three touchdowns, Cap had to throw. But the Colts secondary was blanketing his receivers with their effective zone defense. And Coach Grant's protege from Canada was forced to leg it through the muddy turf. Thanks to his size, strength, and agility, Cap was able to pick up good yardage in doing so. But on a crucial fourth and sixth scramble from the Colts' 20, he came up inches short, and Baltimore took over as the final quarter of play began. Clint Jones's white jersey brightly stood out, but Colt linebacker Dennis Gorbats made sure it would go to the cleaners as he smothered Jones's attempt to get outside. Cap then led the Vikings to their first score of the day. Using his talented end, number 84, Gene Washington, and his equally talented fullback, number 30, Bill Brown, on medium-range passes, he took Minnesota to the Colts' 35. Then on a third and eight, Baltimore made its first costly mistake of the game when Lenny Lyles interfered with Tom Hall on a bomb. And it was first and 10 on the one. Off of a play action fake, Cap hit Billy Martin alone in the end zone. And it was 21-7 midway through the quarter. The Colts then added an insurance field goal with a key play coming and a 16-yard pass to Willie Richardson, who had six receptions on the day for 150 yards. The field goal put Baltimore up by 17, and with three minutes to play, the contest was virtually over. But in the dark, cold, and fog, Joe Cap demonstrated the kind of courage that has brought Minnesota to the top of its division. He was determined to score again before the game's end. And indeed, he would accomplish his goal. In fact, the entire Viking team had played well in the biggest game of their short history. They had not been out-hustled or out-muscled. They had merely been outclassed by a team that had outclassed their opponents on 13 other Sundays in 1968. That is, all but one. And ironically, it was that one, the Cleveland Browns, who would now meet Baltimore for the NFL championship. This was to be a rematch of the 1964 championship, which was won by Cleveland. But this year's Colts are a team of destiny. They are hoping that the parallels of 1964 and 1968 will come to an end next Sunday.